So church, like I said, it is an absolute privilege for me to close off the series, God's Forgotten Postcards. And we firmly believe that every word of our Bible is the word of God. And so it's such a privilege that I get to end off with 3 John. Uh, a tiny, tiny little book at the back end of your Bible. There's a strong chance you've missed it. In fact, I was actually looking in the Pew Bibles for what page number it's on. It doesn't even have a page number. It's just this like tiny little paragraph sandwiched before Revelation, uh, before Jude and Revelation. So if you want to turn there now, you're welcome to turn there. We're going to read through the Bible, uh, read through the book together. Uh, but bef- before we get to reading it, I just want to give you a little bit of insight. Uh, what I love so much about this short, short little book, or, or letter rather, is that it gives us insight into what a first century church looked like, what, uh, what they were struggling with, what they were doing well, and uh, it's so encouraging to see that as John writes this little letter, it's full of love and encouragement. Uh, he does deal with some difficult things, uh, but it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful letter. And so to give you a little bit of an insight, we are going to be reading from 3 John, and that is... Uh, John the Apostle, all right? He's the man who wrote Revelation 1, 2, and 3 John and the Gospel of John, not to be confused with uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was another dude, and uh, he was the cousin of Jesus, actually. And John the Baptist, he died um, when Jesus was busy doing ministry. He was martyred. And uh, this is, we're looking at John the Apostle, so just to make sure you guys don't get confused. And uh, John the Apostle was the last surviving apostle at the time of writing this. All the other apostles uh, are now dead. And uh, we have other characters in this Bible, uh, in the story. We have Gaius, who's a faithful servant in this church that uh, John is writing to. There's Diatrophes, who's a leader in the church, but he's not such a cool guy, and we'll see that in a second. And then there's Demetrius, who's a traveling missionary. And so these four guys, uh, these four people are all in relation to each other throughout the, the book. But now what we're going to do is we're going to read through it together, because uh, how often do you get to say, Today at church, I read through a whole book of the Bible. Uh, It's a brilliant thing. So if you've managed to find it at the back end of your Bible, you can read with me or you can sit there and just listen to me uh, read it for you. All right, this is what John writes to Gaius. The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on in their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. May God bless the reading of his word. So that's a beautiful little letter that we're gonna be walking through today. And as we go, I'll definitely unpack more uh, of the historical background as we move through it. And so we're gonna start off with the greeting, which is verses one to four. A loving greeting full of compassion. Uh, and it's what I love to see in uh, how John writes this is just his, his uh, passion for this guy called Gaius. He says, dear friend, and that dear friend can even be tr- um, translated as beloved. How often do we call people beloved? Uh, it's, it's beautiful. And it's such a beautiful phrase of endearment. So I'm just gonna read it again, that very first verse. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. 
I thought that was so cool, just the way he encourages him to say, man, I hope you're doing well physically, all those good things, but your soul, I'm praying for your soul. Uh, so, so beautiful. And some of the commentators actually think that uh, Gaius came to faith under John's ministry. He came to know Jesus because of what John was doing. And so verse four is particularly special. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So John is both writing in the general sense that this young church is following Jesus and he's, he's so happy that that's happening, but also on a personal note, to say, Gaius, to hear that you're still walking with Jesus, oh, man, it gives me no greater joy. This letter is just so well written and it is so encouraging. And yet it also deals with um, a couple of firm topics and when we get to verse nine and 10. But because of the tone of love that it is written in, it's actually very easy to hear and receive some of the difficult stuff. And so church, I hope that tonight uh, you would hear my tone. If I say something difficult, if I say something challenging, it's because man, I just love you guys. My heart is to see you walking closer with Jesus day in and day out. My heart for you is that uh, you would be walking in the truth. And my prayer is that over 40 years of ministry or, or however long God gives me to do this or however long I'm here at Rosemack Union, I'll be able to look back and uh, back over my life of ministry and see all your faces having maybe been gone to see, uh, be home with Jesus or currently still walking with God and be satisfied with this great, great joy that through life, whatever life threw at you, you walked with Jesus. You walked in the truth. That, my friends, will give me no greatest joy, to know that Jesus influences and did influence every decision you ever made. That you didn't lose sight of the most important thing uh, or elements in your life, your relationship with Jesus. That will bring me the greatest joy. And so today I hope to encourage you to keep your eyes focused on Jesus, to walk in the truth as a community of faith and also as the individual believer. Which moves us into encouragement and praise, which is verses five to eight. John just carries on telling guys just how much he loves him. Uh, and so he encourages guys and he praises him for the work he's been doing for the gospel. When John says in verse five, Gaius, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters. He's referring here to how Gaius has been hosting missionaries uh, and traveling Christians in his home, giving them food to eat, uh, a, a roof over their head. You see, Gaius had opened his home to these traveling missionaries and um, John is commending him on it. Zwei uh, touched on a little bit for us last week on how these traveling missionaries worked. And he spoke a little bit around innkeepers. And just on a little side note, if you haven't heard Zwei's sermon uh, last week on 2 John, these two letters are so closely linked, uh, you really, really need to give it a listen. Uh, Zwei did amazing work in the background of what was going on. So I'm resting a lot on what he said last week. So please do make sure you give it a listen. But the innkeepers, they were not seen as good dudes. Uh, you see, in this early community of faith, it was expected that if someone was coming into your city and they didn't have a place to stay, you were to give them a place. You were to open your home and say, come on in, brother. Uh, you can stay here for free, no longer than three days. That's what Zwei touched on a little bit for us. Uh, don't abuse our generosity, but come on in. And so innkeepers were seen as people who were stealing from people, charging for something that should have been free. And so they were not good people. But however, the issue here is that the generosity that, and hospitality that this early church was expected to show did cause some problems. The early church, very much like our church, were open to be abused, for people to take um, opportunity of the generosity and hospitality of the church. Unfortunately, there are people out there who take advantage of generous people. It's just the way the world works. It happened now and it happened in John's time. And so there was this really cool early church document called the Didache. Um, it's so cool, I love church history around what, uh, um, how churches worked and it's a document that helps you understand some practices within the church, an early church uh, manual, if you will. Uh, and I wish I could tell you more about it, it's, it's so, so interesting. Uh, so Google it, the Didache, I'm not gonna go into it now. Um, but again, it told the whole rule around don't let people stay for longer than three days. They probably take advantage of you. This is why I touched on it last week for us. But one thing really stood out for me. I'm gonna read it for you. I'm gonna quote it. So he's talking about traveling prophets or traveling missionaries here. On departing, he, the traveling prophet, may receive enough food for his journey. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. That's guideline number six. Then in guideline number 12, it says, if a prophet says, 
Give me money or something else, he is not to be heeded, unless the money is for others who are in need. So what I found this so, so interesting because this is exactly something we struggle with here on Sundays sometimes. Uh, and here, John is writing this letter, encouraging guys to continue walking in the truth. And the backdrop of this is people claiming to be of the truth by taking advantage of people's generosity, pretending to walk in their truth, so to abuse the hospitality and generosity of the church. What I find amazing is a first century problem is also a 21st century problem. I think it's safe to say that people have always fallen short of the glory of God and they will continue to fall short of the glory of God. So on a quick side note here, church, I'm just gonna do a little, little devi- deviation here. How we handle this kind of thing, because every Sunday we have people coming in, maybe asking for things. Uh, and so we actually, I don't think we knew we were doing this, but we follow exactly what uh, the Duchess says. Uh, if someone comes in asking for money, we wanna help them, all right? So we have food packs at the info desk. A food pack, enough food for at least two days to send them on their way so they don't go hungry. Then we have a ministry that has open doors, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. We open our church to say, if you need, have a need, we're here to help. That's why the local church exists. And so these two avenues are ways we can help people. We don't give out money. And so if you hear maybe a scam artist tonight, sorry, you've come on the wrong night. Um, we don't give out money because, well, we don't know what that money can be used for. And so church, I've just equipped you. If someone ever asks you for money, send them to our info desk so they can get a food pack they can book an appointment at our uh, guard house on the way out, and they can come back Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, and we will help them in any way possible. You are equipped, now go out and do just that. Back to this beautiful book, side note done. This book gives us great insight into the early, uh, into the early days of the church, and like I said, what a first century church looks like. John is writing this letter somewhere around 90 AD, which means 60 years before he wrote this, Jesus died He rose again from the death and he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended, he promised two things, that he would return and that he would send a helper, his Holy Spirit. However, for uh, the early church, it was becoming very apparent that when Jesus said, I will return, it didn't mean that afternoon. I can just picture those early disciples saying, fantastic, watching him ascend into heaven. Alrighty, so anytime now. Okay, no, we'll go to sleep tomorrow. Tomorrow, he's gonna be back tomorrow. Uh, Tomorrow came, next week came, next month came, next year came, next century came, and here we are, 2,000 years later, patiently waiting for Jesus to return. And so what that meant is the local church was set up. The local church banded together to praise God, to do the mission that that Jesus called them to do, and uh, that is the local church. And the local church back then looked very much like it looked like now. They were worshiping God, they were using Paul's writings, they have the gospel accounts now by 90 AD, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the letters of Peter in circulation. The apostles, the very men who were with Jesus, were the leaders of this church, so was Paul, he was a missionary to the Gentiles. But the thing is, all these men, they've now died. And the church is going into a new phase of leadership called the Apostolic Fathers. These were the the church leaders who had been around, the apostles. So this is a new age in Christian leadership, a new age in the church. The church is now moving and growing all under the leadership of the apostolic fathers and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now the commentators I leaned on in my research were William Barclay and uh, John Stott. And I'm I'm so, so thankful for their faithful work uh, in these letters. I really could not be standing here if it weren't for what they did in their research. And they helped me understand that there were two elements in the early church movement. There was the established local church and there were traveling missionaries. The local church did much of like what we see today um, and the local missionaries, uh, the traveling missionaries, they would pull into these local congregations, preach the word of God, then they would leave, be sent on their way with uh, enough food to to last them their journey. They would go preach the word in in a synagogue and say, guys, there's this, this man called Jesus, he fulfills the law, have you heard about him? And then they would go back to a local church and preach there. It was this beautiful movement Uh, Christianity was very fluid in these early days. And remember, the world was completely pre-Christian here. Middle East uh, was where it was localized. There was was probably a a couple of churches in Europe. There were maybe even talk of a a church in India back then. Uh, Church history is fascinating. But it was very, very pre-Christian, and there was a lot of missioning to do. And so the missionaries had a huge job in front of them. In fact, there may have even been more traveling missionaries than there were local churches. Uh, And I just find it so fascinating how things are different today. 
But what happened in this time is they developed a tension between the people who were trying to lead these local congregations and the traveling missionaries. Nowadays, we don't really see this tension. You see, because local church has the authority. Local churches send out missionaries, and the missionaries come back, and they tell us all of the amazing work that they're doing. And you've seen that plenty of times here at Rosebank Union. You see, because the traveling missionaries, or the local church, and the traveling missionaries had exactly the same authority, uh, they were equal in what they were doing. Nowadays, we have the local church as the authority, and these traveling missionaries Nowadays, they fall under uh, the leadership of the local church. And so, this, and so John, 3 John is written into this context to help try and mitigate what's going on here between traveling missionaries and the local church. In, Di- in, in Gaius' church, he's facing Diotrephes, who was probably a leader uh, in this church, and he was refusing to welcome these traveling missionaries. Demetrius is a traveling missionary, uh, probably under John's guide. And John is commending Gaius for always welcoming the travelers and letting him know you can trust Demetrius. Uh, Let him into the church, let him preach. And the commentators reckon that Demetrius was probably carrying the letters of one, two, and three John uh, to deliver to Gaius. So that's a little bit of the backstory of what's happening here, giving us great insights into this time. Very, very different. So when I went to Turkey um, a couple of weeks ago as a missionary, we uh, we were led through Turkey by Mark. And while we were there, we had no authority. There was literally no authority, mostly because there's no church. Uh, so there's no authority to be had anywhere because, well, it's illegal to have a church in Turkey. But also because nowadays churches have the authority and missionaries submit to that. And so there's no church for us to come in and say, hey, how can we serve you? And I just find it so interesting to see how the role of the missionaries has changed. And so we read in verses seven and eight, John writes this. He says that it is for the sake of Jesus' name that these missionaries have gone out, receiving no help from the pagans. And so we as the church ought to show hospitality to them so that we may all work together in the truth. Now, to extrapolate this example out and localize it in where we are today, we may have traveling Christians uh, in our congregation tonight. We may have people who have come into our building who want to know a little bit more about God. We are to show hospitality to those people, to love and accept them. Because you never know, you may be walking in the truth, working in the truth with them very shortly. You could be serving on a Sunday alongside them in in months to come. You could be attending a CG together. The hospitality we show to strangers in our church is a critical part of what we do here. And so I want to pause just for a second and talk a little bit about what John is not saying in his letter, what he chooses not to write about. What I find very interesting is that in this very short letter, he chooses to write about hospitality of those around you and strangers in your congregation. He doesn't write about what songs should be sung in church. He doesn't write about church governance structure. He doesn't write about how to put together the perfect three-point sermon. He simply commends Gaius for the hospitality that he's showing to outsiders and tells him, keep on going, bud, keep on going. Now, church, I want to say that sometimes I think we can major on the minors and actually just miss the majors altogether. You see, the songs we sing, the brightness of the lights, the warmth of the milk in your cappuccino, the seat you sit in, the style of preaching, church, those are personal preferences. Important, yes, I'm not saying they're not important, but personal preferences. Is the Bible preached here at RUC? Do we sing songs of praise to God here at Rosebank Union Church? Is Jesus glorified in all that we do? Is the gospel centered in our ministry? These, my friends, are the majors. That's what's important. Everything else, everything outside of that is a personal preference, something you like. Are we loving and kind to everyone around us? Just as Jesus was, that's a gospel issue. Do we show hospitality to guests here at Rosemont Union Church? That's a gospel issue. So we are about to turn now to John's concern of how strangers are being treated in Gaius' church. And church, my concern for us tonight is that we have begun to major on the minors and that sometimes we just completely lose sight of what's truly important. And that is simply to be a loving community of faith with arms open wide, people who are keen to add to their number Sunday in and Sunday out, very much like what Gaius was doing. 
Am I saying that we're an unfriendly church? No, definitely not. I don't think we're an unfriendly church. I'm simply saying that let's not squabble over what is simply a personal preference. Let us press on into Jesus and let us build this community of faith in love, hospitality, and generosity. And so with that, we move to John's concern in this early church. John writes in verses nine and 10, let's read that. He says, I wrote to the church, but diatrophies. I'm just gonna pause there for a, for a quick second. Imagine for a second with me that uh, all the apostles, they've passed away. There's one apostle left, his name's John, and he writes this beautiful letter. It's got 14 verses of just, Gaius, you're a good dude, man. Keep on, strive on. And then there's one bad thing in that letter. There's just two verses that are not good. And those two verses are surrounded you, this guy called Diatrophes. I'd be very nervous, very, very nervous. Um, So let's read it. He says, but Diatrophes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call to attention what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Diatrophes is in a bit of trouble here. Now, one of the commentators, Barclay, he helped me see that uh, maybe um, Diatrophes isn't the most evil person on earth. Uh, Maybe he's not that bad. You see, like I said, there was the local church and the traveling missionaries, and the local church did, um, they had a a job to protect their their flock, just as we here have a job to protect you guys and make sure no outside people are um, negatively impacting you. And so it's not a bad thing, but what happened to Diatrophes is I think the power got to him. And uh, John says it very well here. He says, Diatrophes, he is consumed by selfish ambition. And this drive has led him to spread rumors about John. More than rumors, malicious nonsense, John calls it. And as if to demean John and his authority wasn't enough, uh, he then is refusing new people to join his church. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's saying, if you help someone join our church, I'm kicking you out as well. This could possibly have been one of the worst leaders in church history. So that's why John actually commended Gaius so well in those first eight verses. Because Gaius was standing up against this man called Diatrophes. He was standing up against almost the tyranny of this man. He was welcoming people in, letting them stay in his house, almost uh, saying, I'm willing to get kicked out of church because this is the right thing to do. Church politics, it's a crazy thing. So can you imagine with me for a second what it would have been like to be in this church in the first century? Now imagine just with me uh, that if I asked you guys to wave at me, those new people, and you, you waved at me, you're brave enough to say, yeah, I'm, I'm trying this place out for the first time. I said, awesome, can you get out? And who invited you? Take them with you. <laughs> Worst church. Church negative growth strategy 101. And so that's kind of what was happening in this book. And John is writing into that to say, stop it. Now church, like I said, I truly believe that we are a friendly and welcoming church. I, I really do believe that. And while I was away in Turkey, I got a chance to hang out with uh, some of the leaders in, in the missions committee with me. And I asked them, I just said, guys, you know, what brought you to Rosebank and why are you still here? Uh, because I'm still here, I love it, but I wanna know why you love it. And um, the one guy, he told me his story as a, as a, as a, as a youth, he came to our youth uh, back when he was a, a young man. And then he really enjoyed it, but as soon as his parents said, you can decide whether you come or not, he said, cool, <laughs> there are better things to do on a Friday night. No, they are not or you youth, there are not better things to do on a Friday night. Um, and so he thought, man, I'm just not gonna go. And then life went on and uh, he got married and him and his wife were now just thought, hang on, let's get back into church. And he remembered Rosemont Union Church as a young man, so he came in, uh, he came in here. And what happened is he walked through those doors and uh, he heard our bi- the, the Bible preached faithfully. He heard Jesus and the gospel was centered to that. And then what else happened is he met people, people who were friendly, open, and inviting. Uh, and so he stayed. Then the second person, uh, the second man that I was chatting to, he said, yeah, my, some, my story is quite similar actually. My wife and I, we, uh, we grew up in Durban, moved up to Joburg for work, and uh, we actually had heard about a church uh, down the road, not Rosebank Union, another church, uh, a good church down the road. And so one Sunday they thought, man, let's go try this church out. So they were driving down the road, and as they were driving, they saw Rosebank Union Church. And they thought, well, we basically here already, let's just pull into this church. So they came in, saving petrol, wise decision. And uh, they walked in through those doors, 
And again, the Bible was preached faithfully. They heard Jesus and his name was glorified. And secondly, they met awesome people. They met good people out there and now here they are, plugged in, their children have been dedicated here and they love it. But now there is another side to a story and this story it wasn't actually, not actually in my notes. Uh, after the 8 a.m. service, a woman came and told me and said, I'm so glad you shared those stories about those two guys. And I was like, oh, why, uh, what happened? She said, no, when I, um, I came into the church uh, and um, kind of came in, you know, did the awkward look, eyes, look around, everyone looked and looked away kind of thing. She sat down, um, there were all the seats between her, no one said, how's it? And she said, it was such an awkward experience, she didn't come back, she just stayed away. And she, through other circumstances, we'd call it chance, uh, some people call it chance, we call it the grace of God. She met some people who call Rosemont Union home, slowly came back, and because she had friends, this time she stayed. Now that's, I don't know what your story is out there, there could be many, many stories of what brought you to, to be sitting in this chair tonight. But my story was very much that. I had a friend who kept inviting me to church, and I, honestly, to make him stop inviting me, I said, fine, I'll come. Um, and what happened is I walked through these doors again, I heard about the gospel, I heard, um, I heard about this man called Jesus who loved me and accepted me. And I met cool dudes who were normal young guys figuring out their faith. Uh, and so I stayed, and here I am. I was going this way with my life, become accounting, that was gonna be who I was. Turned around and said, Jesus, I wanna, I wanna do this, I wanna preach your word. And uh, my life changed forever and I am so, so thankful that a friend invited me to church. Now what I find so interesting about this tiny sample that I've taken from our congregation and any of the people out there studying stats or have studied stats, you're saying, Brett, you can't draw any conclusions from just two people, but I'm gonna do it, so I've got, I'm the guy at the mic. Um, the conclusion that I draw from this and what I find so interesting is this little equation. Staying at RUC equals pulpit plus you. People stay at Rosemont Union because of what they hear up here and because of what they experience out there. Or to extrapolate the equation, a person will be back at RUC, RUC if up front we do a good job, the preaching is good, the worship is lacquer, and if out there they are met, noticed, and high-fived maybe even get a free cappuccino. And so last week, um, now as I said earlier, yeah, like I said, I really do think we are a friendly church and last week I saw this in action. I did the normal wave at me if you're new here kind of thing and there was a lady sitting uh, back there during the 10 a.m. service and so she was like, hey, I'm new. Uh, she had three seats either side of her and uh, one of our congregants got up, moved over the three seats, sat down, shook her hand and said, How's it? And they sat together for the whole service and I'm almost certain now they're friends. And uh, I just thought, <laughs> guaranteed. And I just thought, man, that is so, so special. That makes me so happy, so beautiful. But church, here's the twist. I don't think that that should be special. I think that should be normal. That should be everybody's Sunday experience. Now, am I saying that you need to know absolutely every single person in our church? Maybe, <laughs> but no, that's a lot of people. But what I would love for us to be is a community of faith that is so closely knitted, that is so passionate about the person who is Jesus Christ, that we can notice a face that looks new, a face that looks lost, and we can just go up to that person and gently say, how's it? Maybe that's all they want. Maybe they just want a high five. Maybe they want to fly under the radar, but that's okay. They were noticed and they were loved and they may very well be back. So yes, we're a big church. It's 250 at 8 a.m. It's 500 people at 10 a.m. It's about 250 or so here at the 6 p.m. That's a lot of people. But I'm not asking you to know every single person deeply. Um, I'm asking you just to recognize some people. So quickly, how many people do you think you can know deeply? You can throw some numbers out there. Anyone? How many people? 10. Five, three, I'm about to blow your minds. It's 150. <laughs> 150 people. It's called Dunbar's number, and it's called the suggestive cognitive limit to what humans can uh, comfortably know. 150 people, they can maintain 150 meaningful relationships. And like I said, I'm not asking you to deeply know every single person here at Rosebank Union. Uh, in fact, there was another study that I read, they said 290 relationships. I think they must have done uh, like an Instagram poll or something, people who thought they had more friends than they did. Uh, so that's not right. But church, what I'm getting at here 
is that I think we all have capacity for more. Yes, not everyone you know comes to RUC, and I'm fully, I fully know that. But I think you definitely have capacity for at least one more person in your life, one more friend, one more name. Now, I want to let you into a little secret. We haven't just been getting people to stand up and greet each other for fun on Sunday. It's been strategic. We haven't just got people waving at us on a Sunday because I'm lonely and I just really want someone to wave at me. Um, although, partly true. Uh, <laughs> we've been doing it on purpose for a purpose. You see, church, empty seats here break my heart. Look at the back there. It's empty. It's not empty for fun. It's empty because there are people out there who need to know that Jesus loves them. But something breaks my heart more than those empty seats. It's the empty seats between people. It's the empty seats that we always leave uh, between uh, some people. And what I'm concerned about is that I think sometimes we're more comfortable for sitting, uh, to sit for next to a complete stranger for six hours at home affairs than we are to sit next to a brother or sister in Christ. It's true. You have to sit next to a stranger. But at church, no, 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 I need my space. I need my space. Church, I... I long to see the gaps close. And so that's why we've been doing this. We thought, look, I could stand here and say, cool, we're closing off the back section. You have to sit at the front like we've done. Uh, we could do that. I could be like the Gestapo and say, sorry, sir, you need to move over. Um, but no, we're not gonna do that because we wanna see, we wanted to raise your awareness for the people that you sit with. We wanted to raise your uh, awareness for the people who come into church who are new here, to raise your hospitality levels. And so that's been the intention for you to greet people so that you might become more comfortable with the people around you, your brothers and sisters in Christ. So church, what I'm calling us to is to move from being known as just a friendly church to being known as a home for anyone who would want to meet with Jesus. Jesus says in John 13, 35, that the world will know that we are his disciples if we love one another. A beautiful, beautiful verse the world will know that we are his by the way that we love one another. And so church, from the front, we will do our part. We will put 40 hours of work into sermon prep. We will put 40 hours of work into the office. We won't sleep until the, the word of God is preached and the worship up here is excellent. We will do that. And I promise you, I really think we are. But we are only half of the equation. There is only so much we can do from the front. The rest, it's up to you. And I want to ask you, are you coming into this building with the eyes of Jesus, looking to include people and bring them alongside what's going on? Or are you coming in with eyes like diatrophies, selfish, my seat, my songs, my parking spot? What I'm calling you to is to, let, to be intentional and hospitable to those people around you and the guests that wave at us every Sunday. And so as, as I said, we'll do our part from the front and I'm calling you to do yours. And so I was so encouraged to hear how a, a family in our church is doing their part. They uh, decided that on a Sunday, there were people that they would say hi to, uh, but didn't really know. And so they thought, all right, the last Sunday of every month, we're gonna have a family from church for dinner. And so just once a month on the last Sunday, they invited a family for dinner and slowly, they are getting to know the people that they sit with in this section right here. Beautiful, so simple. And our church, here's the thing, right? I could organize that for you. Easy game. I could say, all right, anyone who wants to be a guest, you sign up over here. Anyone who wants to be a host, you sign up over here. Leave your, uh, where you live, I'll geographically match you so it's easy for you to find each other. We could very easily do that, it's not hard. But I'm not gonna do that. Because what we want is for you to rely on Jesus, to maybe step outside of that comfort zone and step into someone else's life and say, hey, you know, have we met before? I've seen you around. Uh, how long have you been coming to Rosebank for? It's not hard, but it could change someone's eternity. Paul writes in Philippians that in humility, we are to count others more significant than yourself. And so the difficult thing is to walk across the room and say, hey, have we met before? And that's what I'd love to see our church doing here. We sit sometimes in the same section for years, for months. That awkward, you sit down and you're like, oh, yeah, it's good to see you. <clears throat> oh no, they're coming over. Oh, hey, yeah, how's the week? 
Oh, they're singing songs now. Sorry, man. Oh, okay, we've got to get out here in the last song so I don't have to talk to them again. Um, <laughs> guys, that happens. And it's okay. I know not everyone's an extrovert. But through the power of Jesus, we are called to be a loving community who embraces people who are outside and different to ourselves, people who are unknown. So let's draw people into a fold, into a loving community of God. These, my friends, are gospel issues, and I long to be a church full of Gaiuses and no trace of any diatrophies. Some difficult truths, and Gaius had to hear them, and John had to write a letter for it, and we as a family here at Rosemary Union may have needed to hear that. You as an individual may have needed to hear that. You may be a bit challenged. But church, I'm not standing here as a guy waving his finger at you saying, come on, be better. This is a battle cry. This is a battle cry that we focus our eyes on Jesus, that we walk in the truth, that we as Roseback Union Church band together as a community of faith and say we will be different. We all have open arms and we will invite anyone and everyone in to this beautiful thing called Christianity. And so from there, John moves into practical advice. John writes in verse 11 that anyone who does what is good is from God. And if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are from God. He says to guys, don't imitate what is evil, don't be like the atrophies, but rather remember what we know of Jesus, the God-man who ate with sinners and tax collectors, who invited complete strangers to follow him so that those complete strangers would later on change the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us be like Jesus. And here's the cool thing, church, if you're a Christ follower, not only have you seen God, but he is alive in you. Jesus Christ is alive in you and he will give you the power to overcome those awkward conversations of a person you haven't met before. So church, I would love to see us close the gaps between us to fill the empty seats of this auditorium. And like I said, we will do our part. I promise you that. Excellent preaching, no, (laughs) excellent worship, faithful preaching. Some of you might not think preaching is excellent here. But uh, excellent worship, because I can say that. The worship here is truly excellent. A great location, faithful preaching, beautiful facilities, intentional advertising, outreach, care ministry. We will do it, and we are doing it. I promise you, the rest is up to you. You are the other half of that equation. If you have seen God, do good. Love those around you, invite people into this space. So practically, what does that look like? (laughs) It's very simple. Invite someone to church. That's how I got here. Jesus changed my life. I don't know how you got here, but a person could just be one invitation away from the eternity being changed forever. Invite your friends to church. And if we can get them into this building, we want them to meet authentic followers of Jesus who are loving and caring and inviting. People who are real and who care about so much more than just their comfort. Church, let us move toward being these hospitable people. And so we move to the closing of uh, John's beautiful letter, verses 13 to 15. John ends this letter with uh, more encouraging words. So, so encouraging. He says he has much more to write, but he would rather come and see Gaius face to face, to sit with him and encouraging him in person. This has much to say about the way we relate to one another, uh, but that's for another sermon. But what I absolutely love about this very short letter is the way John ends it off. So what I'd love you to do is read verse 14 with me if your Bibles are open, or um, I'll just read it for you. And just quickly, a side note, we had a bit of an argument in, in the church office on Thursday around this. I've been reading the ESV uh, in my preparation, and the ESV has a 15th verse. And so when I said to um, the guys who put our bulletin together, I said, can you put uh, 3 John 15 on the front? They came to me and said, Brett, you're preaching out of uh, the wrong book. There's no verse 15 in 3 John. Uh, And so I got in a little bit of trouble. Side notes, if if your Bible does have a 15th verse, no one's added anything. They've just taken the last verse and given it 14 and 15. Anyway, side note done. Your Bible's awesome. You should read it. Um, This is how the uh, back end of verse 14 reads. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. How beautiful is that? The whole church, the whole church could greet each other by name. Man, that that really, really encourages me. And the ESV reads it like this. Greet the friends, each by name. 
each by name. That phrase rang in my head every time I read through the book. Every time I sat down to prepare uh, for tonight, that phrase ran through my head, each by name. And man, I long to know all of your names. I really, really do. Uh, And I'm actually quite bad at remembering people's names, often at like a Red Frogs event or something like that. Um, When I haven't seen people for about a year, we'll kind of walk in and uh, there's a Red Frogs leader there. And I'll be like, oh, I've forgotten your name. And then Candice will be like, bro, that's Edward. So I'm like, oh, thanks. Hey, Edward, how you doing? Um, Or if Candice isn't there, I'm just in trouble and I have to own my mistake and be like, but I've forgotten your name. How are you doing? And uh, they're not taking it back because I've taken the time to make sure I remember their name. It's a beautiful thing. Remember people's names. And if you don't, tell them you forgot. It's okay. And so remember Dunbar's number, you can have 150 meaningful relationships. The number of faces and names that you can remember actually is way more than that. Another uh, study that I was reading said, you can remember anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 names and faces. It's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people. Uh, It's a study from York University. And so for you to remember here in the evening service, 249 faces, it's not hard. Hopefully you remember your own face in the mirror. We'll give you that one. Maybe you're here with some friends and family. So let's just knock that number right down to 200 people. 200 new people for you to say, hey, have we met before? 200 people for you to high five and remember that name. It's not hard because you can remember at least 1,000. Uh, my wife, Marilyn, she's a teacher. And I know there's probably some people studying to be teachers here or other people who work in that profession. And you guys are amazing at remembering names. I asked Marilyn, like, how does it work? So she says she's got 170 students, 40 colleagues, and a form class of 30. That's obviously on top of friends, family, and all those cool things. And she had a week, one week, to learn all those names. Because she told me the first way to get uh, steamrolled in any classroom is to not know the children the, or the student's name. And she did it, very easy. And uh, also, some names that are difficult to say. And so, church, I know you can do it. I know it's possible. I know I can do it and I need to start practicing. So that's what I'm calling you to, church, is to be intentional, to be intentional with these people here around us, the people that we call brothers and sisters in Jesus. And what I hope to see is that we move toward, as the people of God here at RUC, we move together, a group of people who love Jesus and who love those around us, especially on a Sunday. And is that not uh, the great commandment? The first is to love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And on these, com- on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second most important thing is to love the people around you. And you can only do that if you are loving Jesus, if your eyes are focused on him, if you are walking in the truth. And so in closing, I've made a very, very practical outworking of hospitality and love for those around you. Uh, I was laughing with a service team uh, this morning. I feel very much like a youth pastor. Uh, Dave will know, uh, a youth pastor always lands a sermon on a very practical outworking, something that they can maybe take home or do to help them remember the sermon. Um, I obviously missed my calling, Dave, I'm coming for your job. Um, And so I've landed uh, on a very practical outworking here. And in an attempt for us to close the gaps between us on a Sunday, an attempt to know the people that we call brothers and sisters. So here's my plan. In a little bit, the service team or the Ask Me team, they're going to come and give you a name tag. They're going to come and give you a pen. And what I want you to do, write your name, stick it on your chest. All right? Then um, the worship team are going to take us through a couple of songs. Then after that, during the benediction, I'm going to ask you to walk across the room and greet a friend, each by name. Don't be afraid to read that name. The rule is you have to go to someone you've never met before. You have to go to a person, or maybe even you can go to a person you've kind of high-fived once or twice on a Sunday. You've awkwardly been making that like eye contact on a Sunday, hoping they don't come across and talk to you. That's the person that I want you to go say hello to. And uh, side note again quickly, after the 10 a.m. service, a dude came to me and said, man, it's it's so cool how God works. I just started working at a brand new law firm, and uh, the, the person that I met that God led me to. Um, Her son works at this law firm. And so now I've got his contacts, I've got a friend I can get to know. And I'm actually gonna ask him why he wasn't at church on Sunday. (laughs) You're a brave man. Um, That's how God works, guys. We don't believe in chance, we believe in the sovereignty of God. And so walk across the room and greet a friend 
each by name. And so that's what the benediction is going to be. You're going to greet people by name. Then you're going to walk out into the streets. We've got uh, tea and coffee, filter coffee, there's hot chocolate, all those good things, biscuits. And what I want you to do is go and have a coffee with this new friend of yours. Get to know each other. You essentially are going to speed date a new person. Ask them questions like, what brought you to Rosebank Union Church? How long have you been here for? Uh, What do you do for fun? What do you do for a living? What are you studying? It's very easy. Then at the end of that conversation, what I want you to do is swap name tags. You'll see on your bulletin, uh, there's a space there for for you to put your friend's name. I put mine there. I obviously didn't listen to my own instruction. But uh, you can stick your friend's name there, take your bulletin home, and you can remember that person. So next week, you can high five them and greet a friend by name. If you didn't get a bulletin, stick it to the back of your phone. That thing's with you every day. Uh, Another way for you to remember that person. And that way, church, we can slowly become a community of faith that is united around the person of Jesus Christ and that loves each other so much that if a new person comes in, we can say, hey, I've never seen you before. Welcome. We should all be pining to be that person's new best friend. And so I'm going to ask the Ask Me team if you guys can stand up. You guys can go and grab uh, the name tags, grab some pens. They're going to hand it out. And as they do that, church, uh, please write your name down, pass it on, stick it to your chest. The worship team, I'm going to invite them up as well now. And as they come up, you are welcome to just sit and contemplate everything I've taken us through here. Contemplate this beautiful letter. Contemplate your role as the other half of that equation. What are you going to do to help close the gaps in the seats between us and fill the seats that we see empty every Sunday? Church, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your attention. Write your names down. Listen to these legends. Lead us in some worship. And then I'll be back for the benediction. Thanks, guys.